welcome to Get Paid for Your Pad, the definitive show on Airbnb hosting, featuring the best advice on how to maximize profits from your Airbnb listing, as well as real life experiences from Airbnb hosts all over the world. Welcome. Get paid for your pad. 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 This episode is brought to you by Hostly, a company that helps you make beautiful guidebooks for your listing, especially for Get Paid for Your Pad listeners. Get two free months of their premium version. For more details, visit hostfully.com slash pad. Welcome to another episode of Get Paid for Your Pad. This is going to be a really interesting episode because I am interviewing somebody who's carved out a very profitable niche for himself near the city of Toronto in Canada. His name is David Fraser, and he's renting out lock cabins in his backyard. David, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Jasper. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. I'm really interested to hear your story. We haven't talked a lot before we started recording this. It's going to be new for me as well. So I'm, I'm very curious. You're renting out a number of log cabins in your backyard, which is something that I haven't spoken to anyone else before who's doing something like that. So I'm, I'm super curious. Thank you so much for, for being on the show. Let's hear it. How did you get into this? Okay, that's a great question. Basically, for me, it started, my wife wanted to live in the country, so we moved out of the city, and we moved out into the country, kind of the middle of nowhere, and I've always had rentals, so I had a couple of student rentals when I was in university, and I kind of kept those, but I've never tried the Airbnb thing before, and what happened was, we started you know, living in the country, and my parents would come to visit, and they'd be forced to sleep on the floor, and they'd give me a hard time about, you know, how can you put your mother on the floor? My mom kept started sending me these little pictures of log cabins on Craigslist. Kijiji is called them here in Canada. It's like a you know one of those buy and sell sites. And at first, I was very dismissive of this idea, kind of resistant to it. I decided you know it might not be a bad idea. So what I did was before I bought this log cabin, I actually threw it up on on Airbnb, and I started market testing it with just a, some stock photos and some pictures of our of our kind of scenic view. We have a really nice backyard, kind of rural area with a nice view. So I put up the pictures of this log cabin stock photo and I put up our, our backyard photos and just kind of see what kind of interest I'd get. And I got a lot of interest. And then I decided, okay, let's do this. So I took a booking. So I had some income coming in and I actually built the log cabin two days before the, the first guest showed up. And from there, I started kind of refining the process, you know, adding little amenities here and there and basically kind of perfecting the system. And then it got to the point where it was so booked up it was so successful, my parents couldn't stay in them because, you know, I was like, Mom, if you come this weekend, I'm going to lose all this money. This past spring, I built three more. I built two more cabins and then I built kind of a central bathroom. So there's like a shared bathroom that all three cabins use. And then so far, I've been really successful. I have people from all over the world, as I'm sure you know, the Airbnb community is really, really great. I've had 99.9% .9 great guests and really no problems. So it's been uh, financially really successful and just a lot of fun as well. So how much do these lock cabins cost? So what I've done is throughout the process of b building the first one, I kind of learned more about the company that sells them. And the first one I think was $4,400 Canadian delivered. That was my cost to, to build the first one. And then the, the other one, since then, I've negotiated a deal with the company that imports them from Europe to North America. So I've got actually a wholesale price. So the other ones are a little cheaper, but they range in price from about I'd say on the low end, 3500 up to about 8000 for the, the models that I have. So I've always picked models that are around 105 square feet just because I want to avoid uh, you know, ticking off the local zoning people. And in my area, if you build anything under 10 square meters, which is around 106 square feet, you don't need a building permit. So I chose those models for that reason. I could have you know, done bigger stuff and started throwing in like you know, kitchens and stuff, but it, just, it, it would complicate the thing. People really want the whole get away from the city crash in a cabin, you know, kind of live the country life for a day or two and then go back home. That's been my, my main target market. And that seemed to be the most profitable niche, at least for me at this point. 
Right, so 106 square feet, so they're, they're pretty small. That's basically, like, let's say a double bed, maybe like a small closet, and then and that's about it, right? Yeah, it's a queen-size bed. What I've done is I've had all queen-size beds so that all my sheets and blankets and everything are interchangeable. So queen-size bed fits really nice. Usually there's a couple dressers. Like, I usually put, like, a little writer's table because there's people that want to get away and, you know, explore their Ernest Hemingway. So there's a little writer's desk in most of them. There's heater. I have a couple heaters. And I usually put an electric blanket and a fan. So one of them, my premium one has a loft in it. So there's a queen size bed and then you climb up this ladder and there's basically another, I'd say you could sleep two people up there as well. And then I put air conditioning in that one just to make it a little different. So I've kind of got one that's kind of deep in the woods that's on the cheaper side. And then there's the premium one that has the loft and then the original one has a really nice deck and kind of has a great view. So they're all kind of a little different. Wow, it's amazing, man. I, I really love this concept. It's, uh, I think it's very smart. And so, you know, you keep them small so you don't get in trouble with the regulation. You don't need a building permit. So you don't really need anything. You just order these things. They're pretty easy to build. Yeah, so the first one we built, my wife and I and my father-in-law built it in basically two days. Really, really one day, to be honest. We had the whole structure up in one day. And then the next was just like, you know, putting the floor in, staining the floor stay in the cabin too. So yeah, if you hustle, if you have two or three people, you can get the thing up in a day. And the company I buy from is like a complete kit. So it comes with the floorboards, come with the roof boards, comes with a door, like a, an opening and closing door with an actual lock. The windows open and swivel and they also tilt so you can kind of crack them open. The only thing you need to add are like screen, I put screens on the windows and then the actual like roof material you can do. One of mine is shingles. The other one did a metal roof. And that's in addition to the kit. But overall, like the system is really easy. Like the way they, they come there, it's like a big Lego kit that you put together. Right. And you don't need to build a foundation for them, do you? Well, you want to make sure that you have a level area. Like I have this huge hill. So probably like 50% of the work was this leveling off the area. So some people pour cement pads, you know, which is, you can do that. I just personally put down big six by six pressure treated like lumber down and leveled that off really nicely. And then I, I built the structure on top of that. And that's what I'd recommend is just do that because that'll last forever. And, you know, it's a lot less hassle than having to pour a pad. You got to make sure it's really level. That was a struggle for me <laughs> because I ended up having to call a friend that has a tractor to dig into the hill. I thought I could do it with a shovel and then like three shovel fulls in. I'm like, this is going to take forever. <laughs> so yeah. I got a friend to help me out. These things only cost like four, like between three and five thousand dollars. But then yeah, you're I'd say I, they're, for the nicer ones, like depends on what you want to do, but the nicer ones are around six or seven, you right. know? And okay. yeah, like you could spend up to 10 if you want to like go hard. And, and mm -hmm. that, you know, I also, I furnished it with like, you know, Kijiji or Craigslist or like used stuff. You know, I didn't like go out and buy like a $3,000 mattress or, you know, a brand new chair. I bought all stuff from garage sales and I tried to go for like a rustic theme of stuff. My wife actually did this also. I shouldn't mm -hmm. say me. Right. My wife picked out all the decorations and it does, they do look really cozy and nice and they look you know, professional, but we didn't spend, you know, thousands of dollars on the furniture. We've probably spent maybe thousand bucks on the furniture in any given cabin. I'm looking at your calendar. You're renting these things out for about 40 to $50. You know, if I calculate real quickly, if you do like 20 days a month, then you're getting close to a thousand dollars per month, which means that you're going to make back your money in, in like six to 12 months. Well, actually, I found it's even better than that. So I, I don't know if I can share the numbers with you. Um, yeah, sure. Go for it. So, yeah. So, I built the first one in January 2015, and within the first year, it made six grand, seven grand. So it more than paid for itself, almost like 170% ROI. But then if I continue tracking that cabin, so I track all my cabins individually, this year it'll make 200%. So it'll make probably around $8,000 year over year. The new cabins I just built in the spring, I don't know the numbers yet, but it's looking like I've already paid them off. So... Yeah, I mean, the ROI is very, very good. They're, they're not huge numbers like, you know, a big, huge Airbnb or a big rental in the city or something. But like last month, I made $4,000 Canadian profit, which is pretty good cash flow for considering I didn't have to invest a ton of money. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible, man. That's, that's really incredible. What about maintenance? They're pretty good. I mean, there's a few weak spots on the cabins, like the locks aren't fantastic. So what I ended up doing was I, I replaced the locks with like a padlock on the door. I mean, overall, I just go in there, like the changeover is really, really easy. I just sweep the floor and then change the bed sheets, and that's pretty much it, you know? I would recommend 
really taking the time to stain the floor really well. So stain it a couple times, add a lot of the extra coating so that the floors are pretty durable because that's where your traffic's going to be is on the floor. And then I've had a few guests that like wrecked some bed sheets, but you know, it's like 30 bucks for a, a new set of queen bed sheets. It's not the end of the world. There's not a lot of moving parts because it's just a cabin. There's no bathroom. There's no shower. I don't have a shower. I don't have a lot of like extra things. Like if you have, you know, 10 room house, you know, say like a basement and like three bedrooms, there's just so many more things that can get broken, you know, for a little cabin. It's like, you've got, I've got a lamp, I've got a heater, I've got an electric blanket and stuff. So there's like just lower points of failure. And if they do, I just replace them. It's not a big deal. You've got a lot of reviews. You've hosted uh, quite a lot of people. Is there any like seasonality in Toronto? I imagine in the, in the winter, it must be a little cold now. Yeah, it is cold. It's freaking cold in the winter. Okay, so originally last year, like 2000, sorry, 2016, we went to Florida. We try to get out of the winter in the cold months. So we usually leave for like February and January if we can. So I just closed the listing down for that month, that time. But this past year, 2017, we didn't get away because we had a baby and, you know, we were building some other stuff. So we were kind of short on funds. So I kept it open and I thought, oh, no one's going to book it in January and February. But I like, I only had the wood cabin built at the time, but I still made for January, February, and March, I think I still made like almost $2,000. So I just put a couple really heavy duty heaters in there. The cabins themselves are decently well insulated. So with a couple good heaters, it worked pretty well. I'm thinking about putting pellet stoves in the cabins for this winter. It's just because they're less electrically intensive. So yeah, I'm anticipating it's going to slow down in the winter, but I don't think it's going to be like, you know, not profitable at that point. I think it'll just be like, you know, I don't know, a thousand bucks a month or something. Right, which is still a pretty good return on investment, even in the winter, considering yeah. that you're only spending like, you know, between like five and seven K on these things. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty incredible, the, man. Yeah, it's a pretty good ROI. Like I've, I've I, it's the best investment I've ever made. And I kind of stumbled into it. So that's why I'm, I'm realizing that the demand for this particular kind of concept slash experience is way more than I can, like I've basically filled up every day almost now with all three cabins and I just had them built really in June is when I had all three kind of going. So I want to build more on my property or actually I'm thinking about buying the land around me and doing more. And then I'm thinking, you know, other people could benefit from this. So it's just kind of why, you know, why I'm talking to you. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of the listeners are probably based in the bigger city, but if you were to live in Toronto and you know, you want to do this, I imagine it might even be worth just literally buying a house with a big garden and then, you know, building those lock cabins in there. And even if you don't want to live in the countryside, you can probably use the the money that's coming in to, you know, pay for the mortgage. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, you could be renting out the house as well and, and stay there, you know, when you, when you have free time. And it's completely legal, right? Because, I mean, a lot of the Airbnb hosts in the bigger cities are struggling with the, the regulations and stuff. But I imagine in the middle of nowhere, no one really cares. Yeah, I mean... I, I can't comment on everyone's individual municipality, but in my area, they haven't ruled on the Airbnb thing yet. It's just, I'm one of like probably two hosts in my area, you know? So, I mean, it's inevitable that the big stupid hammer of government's going to bash everyone eventually. You know, I think you should count on that. I have a strategy that what I'm doing now is I'm building up a client base of people that come and they, you know, repeat, come to the bunkie. So I'm trying to build the database of those people so that, you know, I can, they can text me and say, hey, is it free this weekend? Or they can just look on the website and say, you know, it's free. And then we do a deal on the side because I think eventually I'm not optimistic about the government's ability to just let two transactional people transact freely. You know, they always <laughs> want to get in there. And, and right. so, yeah, I, I think it's a temporary situation. I mean, it depends what you think of as temporary. I think in the city, it's inevitable that, that uh, people are going to start whining and the government's going to start coming in. But in the country, I think that's a slower thing, but it's, it's going to happen, you know? So I do have a strategy in place to make sure that, that I don't, I don't put all my eggs in one basket. Yep. That very, very smart. So you've created a website. It's bunkylife.com. I love how you branded it, by the way. I, I, th I think that's very smart idea as well to have your own brand and to, you know, create a, uh, an email list of all your former guests. Cause I imagine a lot of your guests are people who live in Toronto and just want to get away from the city for a couple of days. Yeah, that's been a large portion of people. There's sometimes there'll be people from the States passing through. I've had people from South Korea, all over the world. But yeah, the primary market is like people from the cities around me. So there's another kind of smaller city called Guelph that's outside of, you know, about 25 minutes away. I've had a lot of people from there. Yeah, the GTA, like the greater Toronto area, it's a big market for me. But 
I'm looking at property all over Ontario and I'm even considering other parts of, you know, North America, like perhaps into the States, although it's a little more complicated with me being a Canadian, just because I, I think the concept could work anywhere. You know, I have a lot of advantages because I have a big population base, you know, not too far away. But let's say you did it in the middle of friggin' Idaho or something, right? I think it would still be profitable. I think it just might be, you know, you might only make 50% on your investment, you know, which is still a pretty freaking good investment, you know? Only 50%. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to what you get on your bank account these days. Yeah. So, I mean, other than Bitcoin, it's the best investment, I think, uh, that I've found at least. And I think that also there's a low risk to it. Like the risk is really mitigated because, you know, worst case scenario, you build the cabin, you know, say you put five grand into it and, you know, you only get a hundred bucks a month. So it takes forever to pay itself off. Well, you still own the cabin. You're not into this huge mortgage and this huge risk of like a market turning and having to deal with, you know, that whole situation. So it's really a low risk provided you own the property that it's on, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's I think it's incredible. Very, very good idea. You've heard me talk about Hostfully a lot over the past few months. I love sending my beautiful Hostfully guidebook to my guests, as it makes me look very professional. I also love including screenshots of my guidebook in my actual Airbnb listing. This helps me stand out from the crowd. Well, now I'm thrilled to announce that I'm a sponsor of the Hostfully host program. Twice a month, Hostfully selects a host and features them on their top ranked blog. This is great promotion for your listing and a cool way to share your favorite local spots to a large audience. What's even cooler is that each Hostfully host gets a free set of organic sheets from the clean bedroom. And now that I'm a sponsor, you'll also be featured in my newsletter, my social media feeds, and you'll get free access to my video course on how to be a great host. For more details and how to apply, visit hostly.com slash hostly host. Now that you've sort of successfully built this business, you said you want to help other people do the same thing? Yeah, like I've been trying to perfect it. I mean, I think there's, I've got a learning curve. There's still lots to learn, but I, I think other people could benefit from it. I think I could benefit from helping other people because you really, really learn from teaching others. So I think helping other people get the concept going and it's going to be a little different for every person and every person's property. I've been doing it in the rural sense. I don't think there's any reason to think it couldn't work in say like a suburban backyard. But it might, it might be a little different, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to think of how can I profitably help other people? So what I'm thinking is, you know, I'd be happy to sit down and chat with somebody, maybe over Skype or the phone and, you know, talk about their specific situation and where, you know, this, this idea might be able to plug into that. And then obviously, like, you know, I've negotiated with people that sell these things. So, you know, I, I've got a really good deal. Like I can get people a really good price and maybe make a small margin on that. And then, you know, if people need help getting the actual listing going and just like all the little tricks that I'm sure you know, you know, how they apply to my situation are a little different, but they're general, you know, best practices of how to get the reviews positive, how to, you know, just systematize it so you're not spending a ton of time typing a response to every single person every time and just what the responses are and how I've gotten, you know, consistently five-star reviews. So just to kind of share from that and maybe learn from people as they go through the process too. Sure. And then do you want to share some of the insights that you've learned, specifically sort of the differences between, you know, renting out these log cabins versus, you know, maybe doing a, a condo in a big city? Sure. I have never done the big condo in a big city thing. I've done the traditional rental, like buy a place, rent it out to students or rent it out to families. I've done that before, but I have never done the Airbnb outside. Well, actually, that's not true. I helped my mom get her, uh, <laughs> I helped my mom get her listing going. She had zero guests. And then I just kind of, used a lot of the things I've learned here on your show, Get Paid for Your Pad, to update her listing. And she started having, you know, really pretty good success for her. She's renting out a single room in her house. But yeah, I haven't really done the full on, you know, buy of a condo and do the whole Airbnb thing. But what I can say is uh, I've targeted people that want to get away for a couple of days. And I have, I've tried to almost avoid people that want to stay for a long period of time. Some people say, oh, there's no shower. Is that, a, you know, that's a problem. But I think of it as an advantage because then people don't stay for three or four weeks, you know? So what that does is it creates a lot of turnover. So I get the cleaning fees. I charge a $7 cleaning fee. That money's bigger because it's more frequent. And then also the reviews get built up fast because people are coming in and out fast. So that's been an advantage. I have little tricks like before people come, I send them, you know, here's what to expect. Here's a video I've made of here's where to park. 
you walk up the steps up to the back of the of the thing and then here's how to find your cabin here's how to get to the bathroom you know here's how to turn on the heater i have all these in one little video so it's really helped streamline a lot of those questions you know and i just find people never read the friggin the descriptions so just have you watched the video is a good question and and when people see it in video format it tends to stick a little bit better so basically where everybody parks and everything is is all taken care of so i don't really need to be there and then i do things like you know, when I go and change over the cabin, I'll text them through Airbnb and say, thanks for leaving the place in such great shape. You know, expect a five-star review coming shortly, you know? And then that incentivizes them. Oh, Dave's giving me a five-star review. I should probably give him a five-star review, you know? And also I have little guest books in all the cabins. And I tend to only review the people that have positive things to say in the guest book, you know? So I know, hey, they've had a positive experience. They're seeing that I'm reviewing them. They're probably going to review me positively. And the people that don't say anything, sometimes I just kind of hang off and I don't review them or just wait up, wait and see what they do. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. That's an interesting strategy. I, uh, I've never thought of that, leaving a guest book. Awesome, dude. I think it's really incredible. So for those people who are looking to, you know, maybe thinking about doing a similar thing, you know, what will your advice be and how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Well, I think I'll, I'll build a little sub page on the Bunky Life website. And then just so, you know, I'd say reach out to me. I'll have a little like, you know, book some time with me. We can Skype about it or, or chat about on the phone about it. I would say, you know, look into different options. The cabins I've found, I think are the best deal. But I mean, there might be something in your local area that might be better. But there's a bunch of reasons why I've chosen these cabins as opposed to other, you know, cheaper or uh, even more expensive ones. Because these are kind of middle of the road in terms of their cost, but they're really high value, I think. So, you know, consider the cabin you want. And then I would also, you know, take a, a hard look at your backyard or your whatever your situation is, you know, is this going to be something that's going to tick off the neighbors? Are your neighbors right next to it? And then, you know, what's your relationship with your neighbors? I've got no neighbors because I live in the country. And the ones I do have are really, you know, awesome. And what I did is I just talked to all my neighbors and said, hey, I'm doing this. You know, if you ever want to come and stay in them, like it's free for you to stay in them. If your family's visiting and you run out of rooms, like it's free for them too just to kind of get that neighborly sense of camaraderie going so that they're not, you know, reporting me to local authorities. I don't think I've broken any local laws, but my strategy with government is just stay away from them. <laughs> like, I just want to live my life with a minimal amount of government uh, as possible. And I would say that's a good strategy for this because I don't know for, it would definitely not an illegal thing, but, you know, at least in my area, there's been no rulings for or against Airbnb. So it's still kind of, an unlegislated kind of wild west, at least in my area, you know? And as you know, from Amsterdam's situation, and, and I think it's coming to Toronto too, like, you know, the government wants to get their piece of the pie. So I'm still paying taxes on all the income I make. So I'm trying to do everything above board. I just want to basically fly under the radar for as long as I can, because it's so profitable. So yeah. I, I got my neighbor, I get like most, most complaints are going to be neighbor driven. So you want to think, okay, like, you know, do I have a, an angry old lady that's going to report me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, absolutely uh, i think yeah. you're, you're you're definitely uh managing it very in a very smart way do you actually meet your guests i do I, I try to i mean i'm a musician so i'm usually around during the day so if they come if they come during the day then i'm usually there and i try to like you know smooth them and help them carry their bags and just usually i'll bring my my uh, i have a three-year-old daughter she'll come out and she'll pick flowers for them and stuff you know so we try to make them feel really welcome but because i've got the videos all set up and it's really very easy to self-check in they can there's been probably 50 or 60 guests that have come that have left a really positive review, but I never actually got to meet them. Right. And you, know? you, you probably don't need to lock these cabins, right? Yeah. Like there is a lock on them. And I always tell everybody, you don't need to lock them. Like we live, we live, <laughs> I don't lock my doors because <laughs> I live in the country. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I do lock my doors. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's pretty safe out here. And, you know, everyone that comes is generally a cool, like, you know, they want a, a rural experience. They want to kind of camp. So they're generally pretty easygoing people. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, uh, for the listeners out there who are interested in making a lot of money with log cabins, if you have a yard or if you're planning to buy a place with a yard, check out bunkylife.com. So it's B-U-N-K-I-E and then life.com. As David uh, has said, he's, uh, he's more than happy to help you out. And, you know, if you do want to go ahead, he might be able to get you a pretty good deal in one of those lock cabins. So I thought like, cause you're kind of helping get the word out, Jasper. So if anyone does say, you know, they came through, paid for your pad, I'd be happy to give them a $200 discount if they decide to buy the cabin through us. 
But even if not, I mean, there's a lot of potential with this idea. And I'm sure I'd rather be helping people get it going, even if they don't, you know, buy through me or whatever, because I know I could learn a lot and probably improve my process uh, yeah. just by learning from them. So, so don't feel like you have to buy from me. I do think we have the best deal and I've thought about it. But, you know, if you end up doing the idea, like get in touch, you know, like definitely don't leave me out of the loop because I want to see how we can help each other. Cool. Very cool. All right, David. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, everybody else. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you back on Friday where for the uh, news episode. So thank you for listening. Get paid for your pet. 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 Get paid for your pet.